thank you all for being here this afternoon. So um, first of all, the UNC Greensboro community has historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Kiawe and Sara. In providing this acknowledgement, we also hope to bring awareness to the vibrant indigenous communities whose members still call Greensboro home and are represented in the Guilford Native American Association and who are recognized by the state of North Carolina. These are the Kohari, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, the Haliwa Saponi, the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, the Meharan, the Saponi, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, and the Wakama Suan. We honor and respect the many indigenous peoples connected to the land where we gather today. We advocate for a university level initiative in consultation with indigenous students, faculty, staff, and communities to make space for indigenous people by investigating ignorance and bias within the faculty, staff, and student bodies, recruiting and retaining indigenous faculty and staff across all departments, creating safety nets for retaining indigenous students and developing coursework around language decolonization and land and water protection, which are culturally relevant and innovative in addressing issues of indigenous sovereignty and environmental sustainability. If you would like to be involved in this initiative, please contact evs at uncg.edu. With that, uh, I will introduce our speaker for today. So Shannon Lloyd is currently a senior associate on the evidence and impact team at the Clean Cooking Alliance as part of the United Nations Foundation. Her role involves contributing to several projects, including managing research efforts related to livelihoods and gendered time use, and contributing to CCA's outreach and coalition building initiative to support low and middle income country governments to make specific commitments to reduce climate emissions from cooking and their nationally determined contributions as outlined in the Paris Agreement. Prior to joining CCA, Shannon worked as a research assistant in the Forest Use, Energy and Livelihoods or Fuel Lab at the University of Michigan, where she researched the intersection of gender, energy and the environment in the clean cooking sector in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her graduate thesis looked at the role of social capital in improved cook stove adoption via a quasi experimental data collection effort involving two cook stove firms in Lusaka, Zambia. Shannon holds an MS in Environment and Sustainability, specializing in environmental policy and planning and geospatial data science from the University of Michigan, and also a BA in Geography from UNCG. So we're glad to have her back at UNCG and uh, looking forward to her talk. So take it away, Shannon. All right, thank you so much for that introduction and for again, for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, so my talk is going to be about kind of interdisciplinary sustainable development uh, and clean cooking and the work that I've been involved in for the past two years. All right, so I know that a lot of this was covered um, in my introduction, but I just kind of wanted to give more context as to what I'll be speaking on today and the background that I've had in that. Um, so I am an alumna of UNCG. I was in the formerly called geography department. Um, where I studied GIS and earth science and environmental studies. Um, and then I immediately went on to the University of Michigan um, to kind of, uh, you know, build on that and study geospatial data science and environmental policy and planning. And during my time there, I worked in Dr. Pam Jagger's lab uh, in the fuel lab where I wrote my master's thesis and kind of found myself in this area of clean cooking, which eventually led to now my job with the Clean Cooking Alliance, which is part of the United Nations Foundation. And I've been at uh, CCA, the Clean Cooking Alliance for almost three months now as the senior associate for evidence and impact. Um, and I also, during this time, during the last you know, month to two months, um, have been managing the quantitative portion of our monitoring and evaluation portfolio as well while we hire for that position. So um really in the past two plus years i've really immersed myself in this kind of area of clean cooking that i'm excited to share with you all today so this is what i'll be covering in my talk today um, kind of how clean cooking fits within the sustainable development goals framework um, what i mean when i say clean or sometimes i'll refer to as improved cooking um, the co-benefits that arise from adoption of this form of clean energy um, and then briefly on my research, my specific research at Michigan, um, and then some conclusions. 
So before getting into the specific areas of specialization within clean cooking, I wanna highlight kind of just how far wide reaching and intersectional this issue is um, and exactly which pieces of it I work in and we'll be discussing. So these are the sustainable development goals. And I know that these have been talked about previously in some of these lectures and I trust that UNCG is teaching on these as well. Um, but these goals uh, were established in 2015 to uh, replace the previous millennium development goals, which were established in the year 2000. And these goals are basically the global agenda for sustainable development by 2030. Um, and so these are the 10 that intersect with clean cooking. And I primarily work in SDGs 7, uh, affordable and clean energy, 5, which is gender equality, um, in my current role. And then I also sometimes work in three, good health and well being, and 13, climate action. So this just kind of establishes like how much clean cooking does impact. And that'll, you know, the emphasis of that you should keep in mind for later in the presentation. So, first, like what is clean cooking? Um, so, I kind of want to walk through what this innovation does and then some of the technologies that fall under these different categories when I say clean or improved cooking. So first I kind of just wanna run through like a little bit of a, a model here. Um, this is like a, a drastic oversimplification, but it'll give you a good idea of um, context and the situations that I talk about. So I want you to first picture that you have a fire going. Um, this is called a three stone fire, which is considered a primitive and polluting um, form of cooking. Uh, essentially what you have here is three large stones with your cooking pot rested on top and then you uh, feed the fuel in between those stones and here we have just uh, fuel wood um, collected. So maybe you're cooking or you're boiling water on it and not dissimilar to a campfire you you know there's emissions and smoke coming off of it you can see it you can smell it it's getting in your eyes it's getting in your throat um, you know, it's kind of irritating you. Well, these emissions contain harmful chemicals like PM 2.5, which is fine particulate matter, CO2 and black carbon, which can embed in your lungs and lead to pretty serious negative health impacts um, like lower respiratory infection. And this can also lead to short-term neurological impairment and long-term impact on health develop, or excuse me, on lung development. And so according to the IHME, lower respiratory infection was the number three leading cause of death globally for all ages in 2017. And so not only does this lead to like pretty serious um, like health impacts and health negative health outcomes, it also can lead to death. So finally picture that all of that is indoors where most of the cooking takes place. And this is what's called household air pollution. It was formerly referred to as indoor air pollution, but it was renamed because that's pretty misleading because these emissions and smoke don't stay within your household. And this is a huge issue, not only for rural communities, but for urban communities as well. So you have all, so this is kind of what we consider at baseline. Like this is um, the traditional forms of cooking in much of the world. And so what this cleaner cooking innovation aims to do, um, so this, for example, is an improved um, cook stove. It burns charcoal and it essentially just looks like a bucket um, and what happens is when you take the, this fire here on the left and put it within, um, you know, this innovation on the right, because you're limiting the oxygen, you're allowing the fuel to combust more fully, and it leads to kind of symbolized by smaller fong and less arrows here, like less um, smoke and emissions. So it leads to less negative health outcomes overall. Um, yeah, and it also, so to touch on also, because the fire burns hotter and more complete, you actually require less fuel overall on an improved or a clean cook stove, which can also lead to um, more financial gains for a household. So just to kind of walk through like a number of these innovations and kind of the, the breakdown or the structure of what classifies innovations into different um, categories. Uh, let's first pay attention to kind of the left side of this figure. So when I say cleaner improved cooking, it has a lot to do with this energy ladder. Um, so you kind of start down here on some of these lower rungs and what researchers would like to have happen 
is as you move up in socioeconomic status, you move into these transitional fuels and then some of these more advanced fuels. So what exactly does something like that look like? So first in a primitive fuel, you again have your three stone fire in the previous slide. And then you move into an improved form of cooking. This still is burning fuel wood. Um, this one specifically is the Chitatezo Mumbala out of Malawi, which is essentially just this kind of like terracotta looking pot that you put fuel in and then your pot is resting on top. Um, this is still burning biomass. And when I say biomass, I mean, um, agricultural waste, um, sometimes like human feces or animal waste is used, um, firewood in this case is used, um, which are super polluting fuels that give off a lot of emissions that are bad for the environment and bad for human health. Um, so then you may move into a similar form of improved cooking, but this burns charcoal, which is considered a transitional fuel. Um, and then you move into maybe more sophisticated improved cooking. Um, this is a Mimimoto stove out of Zambia, which burns biomass pellets um, and a microgasification stove that I'll talk about later. And then you move into what's considered an advanced fuel. Um, this is a, an LPG, a uh, liquefied petroleum gas stove. You also move into ones like electricity. And again, this, these are classified as such because of the emissions associated. So again, this is kind of the like ideal situation that would take place and happen um, according to researchers, but realistically as practitioners see that that is not truly what happens. Um, so I, I should stress that like as you move up into these cleaner forms and adopting these clean forms of energy, you're then disadopting the previous form to be clear. So like you move into charcoal and you are no longer using wood fuel. And that is not really what's realistically taking place. What's actually happening is this kind of image on the right here, which is the energy stack, um, which is where one household may own a few types of cooking technologies and then kind of interchanges them based on the meal that they're making since these cleaner forms of technologies um, are more expensive. Like there's no coincidence that as you move up in economic status, like then you're able to afford cleaner forms of cooking. Um, but it really depends on kind of what food is being prepared, first of all, but second of all, like what is the specific um, circumstances like surrounding that household? Because like maybe they um, can't continue to afford LPG or electricity, or what is the economic situation happening in the geography that they live in? For example, if you live in like Lusaka, Zambia, and a lot of the national grid or a lot of the electricity grid there comes from hydropower, and that is impacted by climate change. If you do not have enough supply of electricity, like if supply um, is less than demand in that situation, they undergo what is called load shedding, which is where certain neighborhoods will not have power for certain times of the day. This can sometimes get up to eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours a day. And if you're cooking with electricity and you need to cook during those times, you cannot, you know, so maybe you switch into another form of cooking that your household has, or you go all the way back down the energy ladder and you're just using a three stone fire um, because that's what's available. So this gets at the like really personal nature of cooking um, that I think can be overlooked. Um, and this is taking place in developing countries all over the world. I talk a lot about Sub-Saharan Africa because that's what I have the most experience in, but this is truly happening all across the global South. Um, and so um, I just kind of want to talk about like the intentionality that should be behind some of these innovations and how they should be kind of person-centered. So getting at kind of that personal nature still of cooking, because it's easy to start talking about a lot of black and white science and different innovations, uh, just as kind of a thought exercise, I want you to first picture the different devices that you may use when you cook or prepare food. Um, my advisor, I remember I took her class and she would talk about like, oh, I bought an Instapot and used it one time and now it's in my kitchen or like, you know, now you have a toaster and you have an oven and you have a stove and you have all of these different things. So I have a little bit of a silly example to just really illustrate this that I think um, is good. So you are at the UNCG CAF and you are, you know, like in one side, you're getting pizza next to this giant pizza oven. And in five steps, you are 
getting stir fry and in five more steps, you're getting an entire cake or something, or you're getting a hamburger or something. And all of these different types of foods require different technologies and techniques to make. Um, and so I just kind of want you to continue to think about like the technology that's involved there and how like other researchers and practitioners can't just come in and say, no, you're gonna like, it's harder to come in and say, this is what you're gonna use now because of this reason and take away whatever technology you were accustomed to using before. So because this is true all over the world, I think a great way to highlight the reason that this needs to be so person-centered um, is this example. This is a woman that the field team met um, from my previous lab at Michigan. They met this woman while I believe they were in Malawi. And when they were going, they were doing a household survey and they asked her if she had or knew about improved forms of cooking. She got really, really excited and invited them into her new kitchen where somewhat ironically, she did have an improved cook stove, which is what her hand is resting on kind of in the background here, um, which you know is in the background and in the foreground, she is cooking on the, this is the three stone fire that I had used in some of the previous examples. Um, and what had happened is that an, an engineers without borders type of group had come into her village and built several people these improved cook stoves. Um, but it was super impractical for her needs as a person because it was hard to use, she couldn't, it was hard to light the stove and it was hard to keep the stove lit. Um, and so now it's used as like a drying rack for clean dishes. And she actually, when she takes her pot off of the three stone fire, she will move it onto this improved cook stove to, to rest. Um, and just to kind of add on like a piece about sustainability here in terms of materials and time, like. If you think about a lot of intentionality, and I don't wanna to speak to the intentionality of the group who put this in at all, um, but making sure that your innovations meet the needs of the intended user is really important because like we, you know, I would like to think that everyone in the clean, sec in the clean cooking sector, like they really just wanna improve people's livelihoods and improve people's health um, and improve the health of the environment and on uh, their, the impact of climate change. And none of those benefits are happening with this user using it as a drying rack, right? Or, or using it as these other things. And so if that, all of those like time, money and resources had really been directed into something that was person-centered um, and that had been understood from the beginning, like you really could achieve a lot of the maximum intended benefits. Um, and that would have been much more sustainable. Um, and so this is why, this is kind of gets at the research that I did at Michigan which were into the demand side functions that influence people to adopt. So essentially like how are people who adopt clean and improved forms of cooking different from people who choose not to adopt? So now I'll address some of the co-benefits of clean cooking. Um, there are a lot more that, I'm that, um, that arise from it that I'm not covering, but these are the ones that I worked um, specifically in. So what exactly are co-benefits when I say that? So according to Meyerhoff and Gupta in 2015, co -benefit, the co-benefit concept implies a win-win strategy to address two or more goals with a single policy measure. So in this instance, increasing access to clean and improved forms of cooking um, also leads to co-benefits in several areas, including health, gender equality, and then climate and the environment. And in some ways, these can also be thought of as positive externalities. Um, I'm happy to go into that more. I don't address that a lot in this presentation. I'm happy to answer a question about that later um, into what ways you could think of this as positive externalities. So health is the one that I have the least amount of specific um, knowledge in. I'm not an epidemiologist by any means, but it's a huge part of the clean cooking story. And it's one I didn't wanna leave out um, and this is specifically for women and children, and this will be addressed more under the next co-benefit, but women are generally the main cooks of the household. So as they cook, they're also watching the young children who are breathing in these harmful pollutants. Um, and that again includes PM 2.5, black carbon, um, and they lead to all of these really negative health impacts. I've listed a few, but this is definitely not encompassing of all. Um, and so I did wanna highlight right at this point, a resource that I was a part of creating recently, which spotlights some of the latest health data and the important contexts involved in this topic. 
Um, you can find it by either scanning the QR code on the screen or just going to the uh, CCA's web clean, excuse me, CCA's week of clean cooking website on our events page. Um, and that'll just take you straight to the story map that I had a hand in creating that, that gets into a lot of these nuances much better. So there's quite a few elements under this gender equality co-benefit. And again, I'm not addressing all of them, only the ones that I have specific experience in. Um, and these are gender roles, drudgery, time use, and health. Um, gender roles are essentially, and again, these are not absolute statements either, that women are the main cooks of the household, and they also take care of the young children. And they often have the least amount of what's called intra-household bargaining power. So bargaining power that takes place within your household. So people with the most amount of bargaining power are those who maybe make the most amount of money and who have the most education. And more often than not, these are men um, because most of these contexts that I work in are patriarchal societies. Um, and a lot of this is kind of um, because women are spending so much time collecting fuel and cooking, they often do not have access to advanced forms of education or formal labor opportunities. So of which women can spend hours per day collecting fuels like wood, which is really like incredibly hard backbreaking work. They sometimes have to walk miles to forests to collect this fuel wood. So time alleviated from clean and improved forms of cooking will give women greater autonomy over their lives. And they can use this time to be employed in a formal labor opportunity, receive further education, and just, you know, and not even limited to those two things, but just truly have the autonomy to make choices in their life. Um, and that can lead, so that kind of creates a positive feedback loop of when women have more time and they have greater household bargaining power, because we know that women are more likely to adopt than, what, than men based on the research. And so if they have more household bargaining power that could lead to greater clean energy switches, which could in turn just lead to more and more switches, um, which creates this loop. And finally, um, health, which has been covered, but I put it here again, just to emphasize that women and children are truly bearing the greatest health burden, um, which is inherently gendered. So finally, the last co-benefit that I will be touching on is the environment. And I split this into two parts, which is like land degradation slash deforestation and climate, um, essentially because reliance on biomass fuels, unsustainable, um, or excuse me, because of the reliance on biomass fuels, unsustainable wood harvesting is taking place, which leads to widespread land degradation and deforestation. So by switching, to cleaner forms of energy, this requires less fuel. And um, by switching, it also eliminates this problem like almost altogether. Like if you're cooking with electricity, there's you know not gonna be a lot of deforestation or land degradation happening because of cooking um, activities. And then for climate, um, because of the land degradation and deforestation, it's altering like a huge carbon sink, which is critical in order to help uh, keep global temperatures from warming past a critical level. And this is essentially, um, if you're not familiar with carbon sinks, carbon sinks are areas where they're absorb absorbing more greenhouse gases than they are emitting. And so they're taking those out of the atmosphere. Um, so finally, one more point that I wanted to um, echo here, because I heard it actually this week, we had an uh, internal presentation on climate and the environment uh, at CCA. And one point that they brought up was that the burning of wood fuels alone globally leads to 2% of global CO2 emissions, which is absolutely huge because by re like resolving this one contributor alone, you can bring down uh, these greenhouse gases, which are a huge contributor to climate change. Um, and it's really hard to find a single emitter that, or like a single um, instance that leads to that greater, like that big percentage of this climate change pie, so to speak. So in saying all of that, I also just wanted to highlight kind of my research here at the end. Um, just briefly, I don't really get into my results as they have not yet been published, um, but just to kind of show how all of this can come together in application, because I know like, 
they seem very like different subjects and like, how are you working on this one thing? Like that's impossible, you know, whatever. So my thesis in grad school was specifically on the role of social capital in improved cook stove adoption, essentially um, because the way that the study firms that we that were marketing to households, I hypothesized that if households and specifically female headed households had more social capital, then they would be more likely to adopt. So I was funded through a grant um, by the NSF uh, and also I think the uh, US um, or the National Academies of Science called EPSA, um, which stands for Energy Poverty Pyre. Pyre is another acronym um, in Southern Africa. Uh, and this was a joint grant through my lab at Michigan, um, uh, labs at UNC and at NC State. And so this grant funds work in Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe over, I believe, a five-year period. And so the years that I was at Michigan, I worked with data from a quasi-experimental impact evaluation that we did in Lusaka, Zambia. So for this impact evaluation, we worked with two cook stove firms. Uh, Supamoto is the stove here on the left, which makes the Mimimoto stove, which is a microgasification stove that runs on biomass pellets, and Vitalate, whose stove is on the right, which is an improved uh, charcoal stove called the EcoZoom stove. And essentially what the study design was is that in working with these firms, we were given locations of households who were already customers um, of each firm. And then we identified areas where each firm may have prospective customers. And all of these were in separate neighborhoods, which are called compounds. Um, so there are no kind of what's called spillover effects where other neighborhoods or other respondents are influencing each other. So what my lab does is utilize household surveys. And so we train enumerators to go directly to these households and um, walk them through a survey and they collect data on that. And normally this process takes about three hours. And I think we had 1300 households participating. So this is just a huge, huge, huge data collection effort. Um, and what the survey does is it asks the head of the household and the main cook um, they're asked I, like 14 or 15 different modules and they touch on all kinds of things like who lives in the household, all of their education levels, the kinds of physical capital they own, the cook stoves they own, the fuel that they currently have in the household, as well as a litany of other questions. And one of the modules, which I was most interested in is this module on social capital. So essentially how that works is we interview all of these households at baseline and then we quantified adoption as either being an existing customer which are in these darker circles or um, if you indicated that you bought a cook stove at either midline or end line so we took a baseline and then the two firms went and marketed to these prospective customers and then if they adopted and they indicated so on our subsequent surveys um, then we had, we quantified them as adopters of this kind of clean energy. So how we, you know, we take this survey and like kind of what do we do from there? So in order to operationalize the data, um, we start by taking our data of interest, which is um, a cook stove adoption. Uh, and then we, oh, and sorry, and social capital variables. And then we also include a number of variables that we control for. This is things such as the household production function, which takes measures of land, labor, and capital, and then just kind of a few other control variables. And we do this so that we're controlling um, households, like all other characteristics of households out, so that we're really seeing only the impact of social capital. And like what the results are that we see isn't for any other factor that we can control for. Um, so then kind of what we do is we build our uh, econometrics model um, this is the model that I made with my advisor, and this was my thesis model. It's kind of been adapted now a little bit more as we make tweaks. Um, but essentially what this does is we, you know, we have our outcome variable, and then we have our variables of interest at the beginning and our controlling variables at the end. And then truly what we're interested in is this kind of binary um, outcome variable, which is the, essentially, I mean, this look, it looks very technical, but the part at the end here, <laughs> um, is essentially we're looking at whether as it's essentially the likelihood of whether or not a household adopted this technology. 
Um, so for all of these variables that we included in our model, like when we get our regression results, we can look at every single one of those values and it will tell us whether or not a way that they answered the survey increases or decreases their likelihood of adopting that. So we can look at, you know, there's within social capital, there's what's called bridging, bonding, and linking social capital. And so I operationalized it a way that was specific for our survey. And essentially I can go in and say, okay, if they have really close personal ties to other people, they are more likely to adopt clean cooking or coming down into household characteristics. I can say, if it's a female headed household, they are X less, more or less likely to adopt clean cooking. And for all of these things. Um, so specifically we, a big factor that we see in clean cooking is that it's truly an econ like the economic barrier to adopting is huge. And so we controlled for in this model specifically, like whether or not their primary cook stove is electric. Like, do they have the funds to, and like the physical capital to afford clean forms of cooking? And so we control for that. And so like, this was like a very, very, very small subset of our population. But I think this one we did find, like if you had an electric cook stove and that was your primary form of cooking, like you were more likely to adopt. And that kind of indicates that a, at an economic barrier for adoption as well. So kind of to close out this like really technical piece, I kind of wanted to pull back um, and just highlight why we do this work and who it directly informs. Um, so this research is important because it helps inform implementers and policymakers. Um, and so it, there's a much better kind of enabling environment for policy creation and really being able to create policy on a local and on a national and even like on a global level, this will help us achieve those SDGs I talked about at the beginning so much faster and with so much of a wider scope. So just to kind of wrap up, um, I wanted to talk about the intersectionality of this issue, not only because this is obviously what I've staked my career in and it's what obviously piques my interest, um, but also because I think it stresses just how important this issue is and by how increasing access to just one area, you can begin to unlock so many other positive externalities and benefits the one I've touched on, like specifically the ones that I've touched on today and several others. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say thank you again for the invitation to speak. Um, and I'm really happy to address any questions. If there's any that, you know, like aren't addressed or that come up later, like feel free to shoot me an email or find me on LinkedIn or something. And I'm always happy to talk about, um, yeah, my research at Michigan or, you know, my grad school experience or uh, my work at CCA now. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Do you want to unshare your screen and we can have a conversation? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Shannon? You should be able to unmute and turn your cameras mm -hmm. on. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. I think you just did such a great job explaining everything. <laughs> Left nothing too much. It's questions. always weird at the end being, you know, put on the spot for if anybody has questions, but I'm happy uh, to answer anything as well. You're always welcome to send me things privately in the chat if you're too shy to ask personally and want to keep your anonymity. Well, I have a question if no one else is going to ask. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks. That was uh, really interesting kind of thinking about these like. Um, barriers to adoption of these technologies and it just it had me thinking of like other kind of forms of technology as well so since i work in water like um a lot of there's a lot of like parallels with like clean water technologies in that it affects health and like having secure access to water really benefits women who are like the primary um you know providers of water to to the household um, so frees up their, their labor and things like that. Um, but then there's, you know, differences as well. So, you know, it doesn't have this like connection to like CO2 emissions. Um, and also, uh, you know, just like this kind of like continuous like input of, of fuels, which seems to me like it would be like a barrier. Like it's just much easier if you can like go out and gather, you know, wood, you know, from the forest rather than having to, you know, buy some of these like other fuels, like the pellets or the, um, kerosene or, or whatever the case may be. 
Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how what you've learned about the cooking technology kind of like applies or doesn't apply to like these other like SDGs and other aspects of like sustainable development in general. Yeah, I think so. I think it's like a huge point that like also you can learn um, lessons from these other areas, right? Instead of maybe always replicating, um, especially when funding and different things like that might be scarce. And so like looking to water or wash um, different innovations or looking to like cleaner forms of lighting. Um, or I've, I read a lot of literature in my thesis when I was writing my thesis lit review about like information communication technology um, ICT forms um, or different innovations because I was I had the great fortune of being in a in a small literature field of clean cooking and then an even smaller literature field of social capital and international development um, of which there is very very few literature on that um, and I wanted to incorporate like GIS things and like different geospatial techniques, which is, you know, the, the pool was really dwindling far and farther down of available literature that I could access and, and use um, and draw from. And so I think that there's always huge lessons to share and to be learned across the global community in these different uh, types of innovations, even though they get a different, or like specifically they're different, but they get at the same end goal. So I think that that's huge. Shannon, are you finding that it, the roadblocks are more um, social and like house, household relationships with you know, the patriarchal societies or just the access to the information and uh, or infra, you know, available infrastructure? Like, is it if they hear about it, they're going to they're going to get it or something? Or are there really kind of like social roadblocks that are kind of keeping them from implementing these? Yeah, I think I'll say that it's super context specific, right? Like it's super, super specific to geography. We've found like, and I say we as like a field of literature, like the literature has found that there are like more people know than we thought they knew about the benefits of clean cooking. And so then we say, okay, well, why haven't they adopted? And that could be for a number of reasons. What we found is the economic barrier truly has been the greatest, especially because a lot of these contexts are with people who make less than $2 a day and that's on average. That's not $2 every single day, right? And so when you have such a volatile income, you're relying more on your natural environment and you get caught in poverty traps, which are, you can't make and there's a number of the specifically um, a great poverty or not a great poverty, but like a very specific poverty trap that people talk about is like a caloric poverty trap where you can't work enough hours to make enough money to provide enough food, but you can't work more hours because you don't have enough food to um, to sustain like the just the calories that you would need to do the work right so um, it's essentially the same for like making enough money and then providing enough fuel to cook like it's it's just another poverty trap that people sometimes get into and yeah I think it's it's super difficult because the other thing that we have found is that if you have like so really getting at the social capital thing is that if you have a friend or like if you know someone a relative whoever who adopted clean forms of cooking, like they got an improved cook stove and they had a negative experience, you are less likely to then adopt because you had this negative experience. And that that's huge. I mean, that's absolutely huge because as clean cooking technologies continue to emerge in different forms and you know the kinks are kind of getting worked out or whatever, if people are having negative experiences up front and then that kind of turns them sour to the entire thing, especially if they're spending like a significant portion of their um, their income or something to afford this technology, uh, that can be a huge barrier as well, which is social. Um, so it's really a, it's really a number of things, and this is one thing that I didn't cover, but that if I got back into the research field, I would be really really interested, and it's something I've talked about at the CCA a little bit um, about if we can fund research like this is on what's called sustained adoption, which is like people adopt these forms of technologies and then 
they use it a couple of times and then they may never use it again. It's like the Instant Pot thing. Like you buy the Instant Pot and then you use it one time and then it never is used again because, and we, we wanna know why. Is it hard to use? Is it inefficient? Is it because you can't afford the fuel? Is it, you know, it's for like all of these other things. And so that's, that's like another huge piece of the pie because we really, so that we're making sure these people like, or that users get their intended benefits, they have to continue to use it. And you know, if they're if they're not, then they don't get those benefits. Yeah, thanks. That touches on a couple of things that I was going to follow up on. Um, so the companies that you're working with, um, you're not providing the cook stoves for free. Then I'm I'm assuming or no, so paid for those. Or? One, so there's different kinds of impact evaluation designs. Some it might be like once you do this survey, we give you a voucher and you have to, in order to even go buy the cook stove, or maybe it's given for free, you have to have this voucher, right? Like, so maybe we do something where we subs, where, or like we as in like impact evaluators, like you might subsidize the cost to see like how that works. We, in these, a number of these surveys, there's modules on willingness to pay. So we're, there's like different, they're randomly selected um, on the tablets that they ask these surveys on, but they might ask a household like, okay, if you had a payment plan and it was like X number of dollars, would you be willing to pay for something like this? And so we try to understand like, what is the maximum willingness to pay for somebody for this technology? What is it worth to them and what can they afford? Um, and so, yeah, so it, kind of depends. With... it kind of depends because the, just to get at kind of, if we're giving it away for free is that um, we've, it's found that, that in order for it to have value to the person it's being given to, there has to be some kind of monetary association like with it. Because I know, like, especially college students, like, you're given a ton of free stuff, and it basically means nothing to you, like, right, like, um, but if you have to pay even a small amount of money, that instantly means more to you. They, this comes from, specifically, I know of a study with mosquito nets, where it was like, do we give the mosquito nets away for free? Are they using them? Are they using them as fishing nets? Like, you know, are they using them for other purposes that are not what we intended? But they found that if, I think if there was a small amount of money attached, then it was being used properly. Um, we do have a um, question that, that I got uh, in the private message, but are you, um, before I get to that, are you working with microfinance companies or, and then you've talked about, you know, continual usage. I noticed it's like wood pellets or some sort of um, compact fuel sources. So like once they get the stove, how are they then getting the fuel to continue to use it? And then we'll, then I'll stop asking questions and I'll ask the question in, that I got in the chat. Um, so, so kind of two parts. So the microfinancing, so as a researcher, I do not work with, we, like I didn't, as a researcher myself, I mean, I was just a grad student and I, so I did not work with even the cook stove firm, firms directly. Um, that would be the private invest or the, the, um, principal investigators. Or I guess um, maybe like the clean cooking alliance or. Yeah. So you know, with by the, you, I mean, like the yeah, the, yeah, the collective me, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, so at clean, at the clean cooking alliance, I, we have a market strengthening team who works directly with cook stove firms. Um, and there's a number of programs there that I don't work with directly. And so I don't want to mix up any details there, but there's definitely really great resources to find out more on our website. Um, and so we work to, um, I think overcome some of the cost of production of these things too, to make sure that these cook stove firms stay in business, I think is the biggest piece there. Um, and then there was a second piece to your question that I forgot. How do they continue, where do they go to keep getting the, the pellets? Stoves, you know? So many of these firms, like, so it's, for example, the Supermoto stove that ran on biomass pellets, they also sell those pellets. Um, and I don't know, I mean, this is this is uh, company dependent on like, if you buy the, it's one of those things like if you buy the stove or the pellet subsidized for a period of time. Um, I've heard of, the, of instances like that as well. So, but the, the vendors do also sometimes provide um, the fuel, unless it's something like charcoal, not all charcoal um, firms uh, or like firms that sell charcoal stoves provide the charcoal, but that is like so widespread. There are people with informal charcoal um, kilns like in Zambia and in some of these Southern African countries like making their own charcoal, like not on a household basis, but like for a community or something like that I've seen as well. Okay, all right, question in the chat. Will you be expanding on your thesis research in your new position at the Clean Cooking Alliance? 
And how will your results influence progress in technology insertion? So will I be expanding my research at CCA? I will not, not through my role at CCA. Um, my advisor and I have worked, um, I worked uh, for the lab through the summer before I, right, like literally right before I started for CCA, um, I, I completed my job at Michigan. Um, and we've worked at kind of tweaking the paper um, in, in a way that we think is like, makes the story like the best, you know, story that it, it is and, you know, what we truly want to get at and, and when you're publishing as well, um, you kind of publish for the journal and like their requirements for articles. And so we've done a lot of honing for that, depending on um, like the one or two that we were thinking about submitting to. So that's like a very, if you've done and published research, it's like a very ongoing process. It's much longer than you ever intended it <laughs> to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so that is um, that is something I'm still going even in my new in my new role. Um, but I think that there might have been a second part of, to that as well. How will how will your results influence progress in technology insertion? Or maybe you can say how you hope that it will. Yeah, how I hope um, in my world that <laughs> my research will um, impact. I think that social capital research is super important because. Um, you begin to understand people's networks more. It's something that I think research, researchers in this field talk about and to some degree speculate about. There is some research done on, um, on networks, on interpersonal networks, but not specifically social capital. And I think it's just important because it's uncovering questions that haven't been asked. Like social capital literature in clean cook stove adoption doesn't exist. Like this would be like one of the first papers on that. Um, and so I would just hope that it just further informs, it answers questions so that we don't have to continue to think about like, is it this or is it that? Like you can begin to have more of an answer with definitely this, this uh, study design is super robust. Um, it's not an RCT, but it's pretty, it's like the next step down, right? From an RCT. So um, it gives pretty good answers to questions that we've been wondering about in the, in the field. Great. Last call for questions, John. Um, yeah, thanks for that excellent talk. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but were you looking at um, mainly, so I was going back over my literature, uh, were you looking at mainly like bonding social capital or bridging social capital? Or were you, were you like comparing sort of like closeness versus like mm -hmm. people being kind of like network nodes in this? Mm -hmm. So we didn't do any network analysis where you do map out all of those like nodes like that's that's a way um, I've seen other researchers do where you ask in the survey like who is everyone you know and then you compare that to everyone else in the community who answered and you can kind of assess what the community's um, connections are we did not do that. Um, what I did so. I came on board after this baseline data was taken and clean and stuff and so I didn't have a hand in making the module. Um, but I got really interested in that bridging, bonding, linking, social capital. And so we tried to map that onto what we had. Um, but what ended up happening was we really had bridging and bonding. And then we had all these questions that didn't truly fit into any of those. And so we kind of operationalized it by, um, we kept, or excuse me, we had bonding. I don't think, I think we have maybe one question for bridging. So we basically grouped them into like, there were two questions for bonding. And then we had these questions that got at, and I created this diagram, which was like within your household, within your close circle of friends, and then within your community. And so kind of these like expanding spheres. Um, and that's kind of what we wanted to test is like based on this framework of bridging, bonding, and linking. And like, this is similar. We tried to map on based on the data that we have um, and operationalize it that way. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I was curious because I could imagine somebody learning, learning about one of these things from somebody that they saw at the market. And they wouldn't mm -hmm. think of that as like part of their community or certainly like their closer kinship network or their household, but like, that would be that classic like strength of weak ties like oh that's an interesting that's I want to know more about that type of thing and then they become this kind of like not evangelizer but like that right mm -hmm. it's like the diffusion model in geography I guess.
Yeah, and we see like in a lot of these literatures that your weaker tires are your most important ones um, with technology adoption, not just for clean cooking, but for other things. It's not the stronger ones that people would, you know, first hypothesize. So that's like a really good point. Yeah. Uh, thanks for everybody coming out. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Shannon. I hope everybody has a great holiday weekend and we will be making announcements for our lecture series um, in which will return in the spring as soon as possible. Please stay tuned for that. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone.